My name is Yi Chui. I'm a professor at Stanford University. I also uh, uh, serve as a co-chair from US side uh, together with Granger. I will be moderating uh, the last session, session number seven. It's basically a round table discussion about from fundamental research to scaling to system integration. Uh, in order to facilitate the discussion, we have uh, we call panelists actually to give uh, a short presentation each person. I also want to leave uh, certainly sufficient time for discussion. Um, yesterday, Christopher Herblin already gave his talk because he need to um, leave early today. Uh, now we will have uh, George Dierberg from from Fraunhofer Institute for Environment, Safety, and Energy Technology to come over to the stage to give the first presentation. Please. Thank you very much for your introduction. Um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to be here to talk about our project Calm to Chem and uh, in the view of uh, the way from the fundamental research uh, to systemic integration. And uh, firstly, I would like to give you a small introduction into the Calm to Chem uh, project. I think you have seen that before. Uh, uh, Markus Olis, uh, I think, showed you this, so I will not uh, go too much into details. But uh, what we would like to do is to develop carbon capture and utilization processes to use or to utilize carbon-rich gases coming out of the steel industry, the lime production or cement production processes or, or out of the waste incineration processes. We call that uh, uh, unavoidable carbon dioxide uh, sources. And we would like to do this uh, for uh, chemical production purposes uh, and we selected methanol, higher alcohols, polymers, and uh, ammonia as uh, targets. Um, I think uh, we, we are talking here about uh, system-relevant emission reductions in the scale of million tons a year. And so we are talking about at least um, uh, world-scale uh, plans for the production of these uh, uh, components. Uh, and of course, we are talking about employment. Uh, because uh, in, uh, at a site like uh, Germany or Europe, uh, we have many, many people which are strongly dependent in her employment on chemicals and chemical industry. Not only directly in the chemical industry, but also in everything what uh, is uh, um, uh, uh, using chemicals, like car production or uh, IT um, hardware uh, and anything else. Um, we have a very uh, strong uh, cross-industrial cooperation with many, many partners. Uh, and uh, here we can see, here we can see uh, uh, the partners uh, in the project. Uh, and as you can see, uh, we have many, many large companies uh, in, the, in the consortium, uh, like uh, Thyssen <coughs> Steel and uh, Thyssen Ude, Thyssen Group Ude but also Siemens, uh, Evonik, uh, Covestro, Linde, and uh, other companies uh, which are contributing here. And of course, we have uh, many, many partners from the academia um, which are cooperating here. Uh, okay, I should not press twice. So, um, and I, uh, from the way from uh, the uh, fundamental research to, uh, uh, let's say, commercial realization, we have uh, different steps in our research and, and uh, economy system. Firstly, we have an idea typically, and uh, this is uh, uh, the topic of the fundamental research. And uh, typically in Germany, we have Max Planck Society or uh, universities which are uh, very active on this. Uh, and uh, if they are ready after five up to eight years, uh, depending on funding, on grants, uh, depending on PhD thesis for three or five or years or something like that, depending on high-ranked publications, um, then we can uh, do applied research in the next step. And uh, the applied research in Germany is done, for example, by Fraunhofer, but also by other universities and other institutions. And we are responsible, or our topic is the technology development and the upscaling in the first steps. 
And then uh, in the next step, uh, after additional five or up to eight years, then uh, the economy uh, can be uh, active. The companies can use this knowledge and these technologies just to, um, uh, to work out uh, commercial realizations processes. But we should ever keep in mind, and some, somebody uh, in, uh, in the morning uh, uh, told this uh, also, is uh, that we should uh, keep in mind that we have uh, a very strong relationship uh, to society in this case of these large um, uh, investments we are doing. Because we are in need of uh, infrastructure, we are in need of the right regulations, we are in need of permission at least, and uh, we, have, uh, we are in need of uh, the uh, su support of society because we, are, we have uh, to establish um, uh, um, uh, infrastructure like pipelines or something like that. And uh, this uh, to uh, total process uh, uh, takes uh, 15 up to, let's say, 25 years, something like that. And that's, uh, if, if we are doing this in this conventional approach, it's uh, a too long time. So. What we are doing in the Carbon to Chem project um, is we are doing um, the integration of knowledge by uh, an integrated uh, project development. And this is a topic, uh, it's more a management topic I would like to talk about as uh, um, uh, scientific topics. So we, we are uh, uh, cooperating very close together. We have uh, common uh, places to, uh, to work together in, um, in our laboratories and, and uh, um, workshops. Um, and so we can uh, accelerate uh, the uh, development. And we can also uh, communicate uh, directly with uh, society players, like uh, politicians or uh, people from the government. Um, Firstly, we have to define a common uh, visions and aims in this project. And this is not uh, very easy because all partners have to be committed to these uh, aims. Uh, but they have, of course, different objectives. They have uh, uh, different time scales. If the uh, economy partners, the companies have uh, research requirements, they would like to have the results yesterday. Uh, uh, but if the fundamental researchers uh, or the applied researchers are doing that, they have to write um, um, reports uh, and they have uh, three year times of uh, funding period um, uh, and something like that. And they have, uh, of course, uh, different objectives uh, in, in, uh, in the mean of also uh, um, uh, the uh, results they would like to um, uh, receive. Um, the fundamental researchers, for example, uh, are very interested, uh, of course, in uh, fundamental research. Uh, and uh, they have to uh, publish um, in high-ranked uh, um, uh, journals uh, just to prepare uh, the next Nobel Prize. Uh, Congratulations to the partners from Max Planck Institutes. And um, so uh, they have, of course, other objectives uh, as, for example, the applied researchers and the, uh, the company partners. Um, uh, uh, if we are talking about such a large consortium with such many partners uh, from, uh, come from, from larger companies, we have also, of course, this uh, conflicting interest, sometimes concerning secrets uh, of technological details, um, but also uh, in the view of compliance, uh, because uh, we have a very strong um, uh, competitive laws uh, in, uh, in, in Germany or in Europe, uh, so uh, we have uh, also problems just to, uh, to communicate uh, open. Um, we have, uh, an, uh, uh, we have established in our project, and this is uh, one uh, aspect which, is, uh, uh, which has to be done in such a large project, we have to establish um, uh, an, uh, um, uh, an established uh, communication um, uh, um, uh, uh, part. Uh, the partners should uh, communicate uh, the same about the same thing, and that's not, not natural to do that, because they have different uh, interests, and so uh, the interpretation of uh, aims and, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, visions are different, and this makes some problems in the communication internal, but also ex external. Uh, and we have to learn uh, the technical di languages from many, many different disciplines. We have uh, chemistry, physics, we have uh, engineers, uh, but also uh, economy and environmental experts, and they all have their own technical languages. We have to learn that and we have to harmonize that. Um, if we are just interested to uh, do uh, such a uh, development from, from basic research uh, up to um, uh, commercial um, uh, plans, we have to, uh, to deal with many uncertainties. Uh, we have uh, to 
we are talking about investments of hundreds, uh, uh, millions or billions of, uh, of uh, uh, euros for investments for decades. But we have also uh, uncertainties for decades, like uh, the emission permissions which are changing uh, and uh, the, um, uh, the emission uh, prices are changing. We have financial markets, taxes, infrastructure. We have uh, um, environmental regulations. At least we have also uh, environmental catastrophes or political crises, as we know in these days. And everything uh, is uh, uncertain uh, for the next decades. Uh, and, and for these decades, we have to change everything. And this makes uh, the development uh, uh, very um, uh, um, uh, complicated. And uh, how can we now uh, define uh, what is, uh, uh, under this background, what is an, an, an optimal overall solution? And uh, we are doing this in this four or five steps which are uh, shown here. We firstly do experiments in laboratories so that we have, let's say, something like evidence. Uh, uh, and we are scaling up these experiments over the workshop to the demo plant. Um, uh, but from the early beginning of the project, we started with modeling and simulation, and, and uh, uh, continuously the models are validated by uh, the uh, experiments and labs. And we have a cooperative numer numerical simulation uh, system developed where we can use black and gray box models from the companies and from the scientific partners uh, to simulate the total process, the total system. And then we are able to make analysis of the system for uh, um, uh, the uh, resilience, the flexibility uh, of the uh, processes, and at least uh, also uh, we can do calculations for production cost, calm footprint, and any other things based on um, uh, 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 material and uh, energy balances and flows. We are doing this uh, in, in this procedure, just starting here with the uh, uh, technical um, experiments uh, in, in the uh, detailed projects concerning catalysts, concerning um, um, uh, uh, reactors, uh, separation columns, uh, materials, and so on and so on. Um, uh, we are uh, 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 defining synthesis routes where we have uh, defined uh, the targets, the chemical targets we would like to deal with. Um, uh, based on that, uh, we can uh, uh, define a technical system approaches, concepts, uh, block diagrams, and something like that. And uh, together with the um, assumptions and the external boundary uh, assumptions we have to do, we can do uh, procedural configurations, do simulation, and we have uh, over a period of time of a model year or so, um, uh, the um, the uh, mass flow and energy flows and everything else and can uh, do uh, economically, uh, ecologically um, um, evaluations and we can uh, talk to, the si uh, to society with uh, concrete uh, data. data. Um, and of course we can talk about business models. This is another very complicated part because we have many, many partners in the system uh, which have uh, uh, different, uh, which have to fulfill different uh, um, tasks in the total system. There's one partner who has carbon dioxide problem because he has to get rid of the CO2. We have another partner who, is, who has a need of hydrocarbons or carbon or carbon. Uh, we have uh, partners which are able to um, or interested in, in technological um, uh, equipments uh, and so on. Uh, if you would like to make the first step, uh, everybody must uh, uh, um, uh, be uh, must must be included must be included into the business model just to share risks and uh, chances. And just to have a look uh, that we are doing also some scientific results. So we are doing this uh, kind of uh, uh, total uh, s uh, system simulation. Uh, I, I will not uh, uh, declare this in detail. But what you can see here is uh, a steel mill uh, on the left upper side here. Um, here we have uh, everything concerning the gases, uh, cleaning and conditioning the glasses. Here we have a methanol plant uh, in different blocks. Here we have a hydrogen um, uh, uh, production system, electrolyzer, and uh, a power station for flu, flu gases and so on. And everything is simulated uh, by using uh, this dynamic uh, input uh, of uh, all these gases, uh, um, uh, mass flows, and uh, the electricity um, uh, uh, supply. And at the end of the day, we are producing um, uh, um, uh, results like this, uh, where we can uh, compare uh, the uh, carbon footprints, uh, the gas warming impact of different alternatives and different scenarios. 
And uh, this is done uh, in cooperation with uh, 22 partners um, uh, from industry and from academia. Thank you very much for your attention. If you are interested in details, you may have a look on our publications in the chemical uh, engineer technique issue series we made. Um, it's open uh, for access and it's in English, uh, so you may don't hesitate to, uh, to uh, download it. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. I wanted to talk today about five challenges in decarbonizing electrochemical or decarbonizing chemical transformations and particularly uh, electrifying those chemical transformations. So um, the first one of these I'll call task number one, direct air capture, also known as putting the genie back in the bottle. And so we've already heard about uh, direct air capture and how challenging it is, but also how we're going to need to do some number of gigatons per year of it. So we need to get ready now, which I agree with. <clears throat> and uh, the challenge, I think, is best highlighted by looking at the energy costs in some of the solutions that have been developed, which is typically 8 to 10 gigajoules per ton of CO2. And I think a good target would be to be between a third and a half of that, which is a pretty big leap. Uh, and you can see from some simple math why that's a pretty important priority. Uh, Jen Wilcox talked about $100 a ton. And of course, our energy budget needs to be <clears throat> maybe a third or a half of that budget. And at five cent electricity, you get pretty quickly to the conclusion that you may be able to live with three or four gigajoules per ton, but you can't live with eight to 10. So there are many parallel solutions that are being developed. Again, Jennifer Wilcox spoke about two prominent ones in the DAC hubs, <clears throat> the carbonate-based approach and also the uh, approach based on the solid amines. And where we're focusing our attention is trying to see how we can utilize electricity. Obviously, it needs to be low carbon intensity electricity per the points that Nicholas was making. Uh, to, uh, first of all, achieve a net, a true net carbon reduction and to do that energy efficiently. So an example of one of the approaches that we're taking is to make a kind of switchable capture molecule. Um, this has been done especially in solution, but we're seeking to build solid materials such as quinone-based MOFs, metal organic frameworks, which we can then load on a solid support and use more the, the dry capture technology and then instead of doing a temperature or a voltage, uh, temperature or a vacuum swing, do a voltage swing, essentially cycle the redox nature of this capture and release set of molecules, but adsorbed on a solid support. And so in many ways, it actually resembles quite closely some of the familiar capture and release systems in the form of the contactor, and we lever the contactor technologies that others have previously developed to interact the CO2 in the air uh, with the capture moiety. Uh, and then we simply go into an electrical release and a CO2 collection stage. Um, so once we've uh, put the genie back in the bottle, it's always interesting to see what we could do with it. Many of the speakers today, including uh, Marcus and the previous speaker just immediately before me, talked about you know when we have CO2, how can we utilize or upgrade it? Um, so that's the second task I wanted to talk about. But I wanted to talk about an approach that might help to contribute to this problem of the energy cost of DAC uh, that's called reactive capture. And in reactive capture, we actually combine the steps of capture release and the step of upgrade. And I'll try to show that it offers the potential for a reduction of the total energy of the production of the fuel or the fuel precursor. So I think people understand pretty well already um, this kind of idea of, of potentially going towards in the direction of neutral fuels or potentially carbon negative materials if we get it right. So I'll skip it. And, and I think we've also spoken to already lots about the sectors that are hard to decarbonize and the fact they have very large emissions. And the ones on the right, we hope in particular we might be able to move in the direction of being carbon neutral instead of having these large carbon intensities. So the direct air capture techniques that we've already spoken about um, come at this quite large energy cost that I referenced. And the approach that we're taking is to, is shown in the bottom row, and is to seek to use an electrolyzer 
that acts on the capture liquid, so imagine a carbonate or a, a liquid-based amines, and then we perform electrolysis on the CO2 as it's contained within the capture liquid. And then when we do that, when we upgrade it, say, to CO or to ethylene, it's no longer captured. And so whatever CO2 we haven't reduced electrochemically is still captured, but what we have reduced is now released as CO or as syngas or as ethylene. And so we have a substantially pure stream of our product, and we've automatically separated it from the CO2. So one approach that we've used to do this is to um, make syngas from a carbonate capture liquid. This relies on a bipolar membrane, kind of in the middle of my electrochemical setup there. And in the bipolar membrane, we are able to produce protons that release the CO2 from the captured state. And then on the left, the cathode electrochemically reduces that now dissolved CO2 to CO. There is some accompanying production of hydrogen in current systems, and so we get syngas ratios between two to one and three to one are, are all possible. Um, this is a bit of an eye chart, I apologize, but I'm gonna try to just focus attention on the row labeled total energy in gigajoules. And the three columns, I'm comparing what if you did DAC with carbonate solution uh, and then you did co-electrolysis. So say you produced CO from an SOEC and you produced hydrogen from a water electrolyzer. <clears throat> we estimate about a 56 gigajoule cost for the two to one syngas. On the right, reverse water gas shift where we've really modeled it as being essentially perfect um, based on the hydrogen. It's really just limited by the efficiency with which you can produce the hydrogen. Um, but it still has the DAC capture and release cost. And then the middle column is this carbonate electrolysis to syngas. You'll see that it's already based on lab data achieving less than 50 gigajoules per ton for the syngas. Uh, and the reason is that it uh, reduces the cost associated with the energy release. It also electrifies, and so it reduces the carbon intensity in the row below. In terms of what we're exploring here, it would be potentially to move beyond just making the syngas. That, that may be a useful approach, but it may be useful to make uh, a further along product. And so recently reported uh, a system that goes from captured CO2 in the form of carbonate to ethylene and showed a continuous system operating for 25 hours and producing the ethylene's dactic chemicals where we've recently shown that we can go from captured CO2 to one butene uh, and then integrating potentially with a Fischer-Tropsch system, both for the air capture and then also for the recycle loop for the CO2 that comes off of the tail gas from Fischer-Tropsch. Uh, we're working on uh, a strategy there that um, could provide both functions through a reactive capture system. And then finally, a little bit like Pedong, we're very interested in uh, captured CO2 to intermediates that, that biology can then upgrade further into molecules that we maybe are going to be very hard for us to do abiotically, like foods, proteins, and fats. So my, my third thrust is actually about decarbonizing hydrocarbon oxidations. And this is some work that we, the, the analysis we reported with Andre Bardo, um, then at RWTH Aachen, uh, since moved to ETH Zurich, uh, about the value of coupling the production of something like hydrogen with something useful and decarbonizing on the anode. And so um, the motivation here comes from the fact that um, the total size of the ammonia market is actually not too far off the size of the sum of the big oxidation reactions, like the sum of propylene to propylene oxide and ethylene to ethylene glycol, et cetera. So there's, there's kind of a commensurability between pairing these cathodic and these anodic reactions. And so in the lab, this actually looks like uh, an electrolysis system that replaces oxygen evolution with organic oxidation known as OOR. And um, the analysis from Andre and his team was that this coupled approach uh, cuts in about half, um, well, actually, doubles, increases by 2x, the benefit in terms of GHG reduction per megawatt hour. Essentially, you're decarbonizing two things at the same time, 
but it actually costs you less voltage because the selective oxidation of the, of the organics actually requires a little bit less of a potential on the oxidative side than water oxidation does. And so one of the things that gets us excited here is that whereas with hydrogen, when you're using grid carbon intensity, you're not going to get a benefit in CO2 emissions reduction until you reach some threshold around 200 grams CO2 per kilowatt hour. Um, this coupled approach, even at today's grid intensity, gives you the potential to decarbonize partially, and then it involves, obviously, a rapid descent down to about an 88 percent reduction in the total carbon intensity. So in examples of some of the reactions we work on here were electro-oxidizing propylene to propylene glycol, and um, we're doing this both in a direct oxidation process, but we're also doing it through what we call electrified hydrogen peroxide production. And so there's many things you can selectively oxidize with hydrogen peroxide. And so being able to or reduce the carbon intensity compared to the anthroquinone process of making hydrogen peroxide is, is a valuable uh, thrust. Um, my last two tasks, one is about scale. And I thought I'd just tell a story of scaling, initial scaling. Um, we've been working on CO2 to ethylene for quite a long time. It's kind of how we got into electrifying carbon-based chemical transformations. And our first effort was to really kind of hack a flow cell and develop something that, that looked like a, a water-splitting electrolyzer, but for CO2, the benefit being to increase the current density and therefore reduce the capital cost of future systems. And uh, this was a partnership with Total Energies, and there was a lot of effort on increasing the current densities by about an order of magnitude relative to where they were, uh, and also building systems that, for example, couple the solid oxide cell to CO with an efficient CO reduction device. Um, but for us, we took on the challenge of scaling even before the technology was fully mature, like we hadn't met all of our targets, we hadn't met all our energy efficiency targets or our reliability targets, um, but still in the partnership with Total and also with some government support, we scaled from the lab scale gram per day to about 100 kilograms per day in a lab demo. And we sure learned a lot of things uh, in the course of doing that and I think it was, it was a valuable thing to do even at that early stage. And then my, my last theme is about accelerating. And um, here, as many of you also are excited about, we're excited about whether machine learning can potentially help us move faster to discovering new materials. Uh, computationally, we've found that it can reduce the number of DFT calculations we need to do to predict new catalysts. So in one recent study, we were able to do 4,000 DFT calculations, but explore a 230,000 site chemical space for a 60-fold multiple. I'm going to describe to you the formate bicarbonate cycle. It's a concept that we have uh, introduced 35 years ago. <laughs> and uh, five years ago, we established a startup company named Hydrox which uh, actually generate most of the results uh, I'm going to show you today. Um, all right, so this is the cycle, which is the basic, uh, the basis for this hydrogen storage and energy storage concept. And uh, what actually is taking place here is a reversible reaction between potassium formate and potassium bicarbonate. And at the same time, when I take water and, and potassium formate in presence of the catalyst, the catalyst is here, I release hydrogen and potassium bicarbonate. The reaction is reversible. So when I take hydrogen and potassium bicarbonate, I release water and potassium Format. So based on this, we have developed the concept and the idea is uh, simple. Let's look at the uh, 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 cycle here where we have a source, power source. We have 
water electrolysis, we release hydrogen, and this hydrogen is being stored in different carriers. In our case, it's a potassium formate. And when you release it, uh, again, catalytically, you have the hydrogen uh, ready to be distributed. So the, the concept is again uh, being shown here. And the, the term is called liquid hydrogen carrier. And again, it's taking the uh, hydrogen that you produce by various methods, uh, you convert it into the carrier, and then the carrier is being transported, and eventually you uh, decompose it to release the hydrogen. Now, why potassium formate? It's non-corrosive and it's non-toxic, and it's used as the icer. And also we heard today that it can be produced by uh, a CO2 capture and, and reaction. It's the most water soluble salt known of all the salts. It's up to 770 grams of salt per 100 milliliter, amazing number. It's indefinitely stable in solid state and in aqua solution. It's rapidly and selectively decomposed to hydrogen in presence of catalyst, and it's easily rechargeable. The reaction is reversible. And then, very important, minimal energy consumption per cycle, no need of pressure, and actually this liquid is cheaper than gasoline. Here it is. Sodium, a potassium formate, solution in water. You can keep it in plastic. No problem, and you can actually store it anywhere uh, uh, you want. Now, as I said, the reaction is reversible. And most interesting, the enthalpy of reaction is very low, and the free energy of the reaction is very low. And this is very meaningful for the uh, uh, issue of the hydrogen storage. Now, this demonstrates that, of course, there are numerous hydrogen carriers of all types, there are some chemical, some physical. What we have shown is actually the format bicarbonate cycle is the simplest one in terms of pressure and temperature you need for the release and temperature and pressure you need for the charge. In both cases, the formate bicarbonate cycle is very, very uh, low in this uh, list, and it has a, a great advantage over other uh, carriers, uh, including uh, uh, ammonia, including uh, borohydride, and so on and so forth. Just for the sake of comparison, we'll not go into details here, but we did a simple benchmark versus batteries of the Tesla class three and of the Tesla power wall. In both cases, the, both the volume and the weight of the uh, material of the hydrogen, carrying the hydrogen is much lower for this potassium formate uh, solution. So we started uh, obviously in laboratory scale. And what we see here is the quantitative kinetic measurement of the rate of hydrogen production for the release of hydrogen, and uh, same for the, uh, by measuring the pressure drop, uh, we measured the rate of the uh, hydrogen charging. So let's uh, get now to the issue of scale up. And there are three issues that I will describe. First of all is the catalyst, particularly the catalyst deactivation. Second, the uh, scale up of the process. And finally, the economical benchmarking of this uh, uh, concept versus other uh, methodologies. So let's start with the issue of a uh, catalyst deactivation. And when we started the work, uh, we were uh, actually frustrated by the fact that the catalyst is losing activity within minutes. 
And what we see here is the rate or the uh, expressed as a, a turnover frequency of the catalytic activity versus time. And you can see that the catalyst is losing its activity within 45 minutes and at 90 minutes, it's zero activity. It took us years to understand what is going on here. The catalyst is palladium on carbon. And it turns out that the nature of the carbon carrier is critical for the catalytic activity. And after years of working, uh, we end up with this. This is a demonstration how the catalyst uh, deactivation was solved. And what we see here is the very, very stable catalytic activity for 300 minutes. Today, we already reached something like 1,000 minutes. And uh, this means that essentially uh, uh, the catalytic reaction can be scaled up and can be carried out uh, uh, utilizing the uh, uh, solution that we found for that uh, deactivation uh, step. Next, we'll go to a scale up. And what we see here is the device that we have built in the lab for scale up of 50 times the laboratory scale. And actually this uh, setup uh, release five to seven kilograms of hydrogen per day. The hydrogen is very pure and can be uh, applied uh, to fuel cell uh, essentially directly. Uh, another issue that we uh, demonstrated is uh, this kind of uh, small vehicle, uh, which was built and applied where the technology was applied. This is what is in the back of this vehicle. So you have the decomposition device uh, releasing the hydrogen, hydrogen going to a fuel cell, and you can drive this uh, very, very small, but uh, effective uh, vehicle to you, that you can drive it for several kilometers uh, easily. Next, let's talk about the scale up and the scale up and the next step, which is uh, uh, already about halfway uh, ready. The hydrogen capacity of this uh, uh, carrier is 100 kilogram per of hydrogen per hour. The energy capacity is three, mega, uh, uh, three megawatt. And the size, which we can see here, is highly reasonable. The container is 20 feet container. And this means that the footprint is uh, almost uh, 15 uh, cubic meter. And uh, you can see what's going inside. So this um, container you can ship overseas or wherever you want it, and use it as is for the hydrogen charging and releasing on site. The following step will be 1,000 kilogram per, uh, of hydrogen per hour. The footprint is shown here. And the tank volume is 1,000 uh, cubic meter. This will release, as I say, 1,000 kilograms of hydrogen per hour. So far for the scale up. And let us uh, take a look at some benchmarking of the technology. This is a technology introduced by Toyota, a Japanese company which are using LOHC, liquid organic hydrogen carrier. This is one of our main competitor. And what we see here is the reaction they are using for the hydrogen storage and delivery. 
So they use in toluene, they hydrogenate it to methyl cyclohexane. The methyl cyclohexane is being transported and released eventually with the backward reaction. Methyl cyclohexane in presence of a catalyst release met a toluene and hydrogen. So the reaction is reversible. You go back and forth and you deliver your hydrogen uh, overseas actually. And this is already commercial. You may check it in the, in the, on the web. And here is the 5,000 kilometer of delivery of hydrogen using this methyl cyclohexane concept. So they do the hydrogenation in a Brunei, drive the methyl cyclohexane to Kawasaki, 5,000 kilometers away, and release the hydrogen over there. It's uh, actually a very uh, a unique initiative. And you can see here that Chioda has a vision global vision that uh, looks like here. I'm not going to describe it in detail. You can take a look. But at the moment, they are planning to deliver hydrogen from a, a Brunei or from a, a this area to, a, to a, a Holland. And this is already starting to be materialized. And uh, within several years, I believe we're going to see this. Now, the most important issue that is relevant to our discussion today is the following. This is the most important slide in my presentation. What it shows you is that the energy you consume to store one kilogram of hydrogen in kilowatt hours is the following. For the Chioda technology, here it is, you use 12.5 kilowatts, and what you have left is only 3.5. Other competitor is called Hydrogenius. It's a German company, by the way. And there, the need or the consumption of energy for the storage, 13.3 kilowatt hour. So you left only with 2.7. And it's still economic. This economical. This is the a major point that I wish to emphasize here. Now, of course, liquefied hydrogen is also very expensive in energy. And in our system, it's somewhere between 0 to 2.2 kilowatt hour. So we are left between 13.8 to 16 kilowatt hour. So there is no doubt that if Chioda is running their business and they are not losing money, then the potential of the format B carbon cycle is uh, enormous. All right, some uh, other comparison. Uh, as you probably know, ammonia has been uh, offered as a technology for a hydrogen transfer. And uh, already uh, in Australia, at least, there are several uh, attempts to run it commercially. And uh, what we have here is uh, the hydrogen ship transportation ammonia versus the hydro X. So uh, let's look at the CAPEX. The CAPEX for ammonia is here. And for our technology is here. It's four times lower. And for the OPEX, the ammonia is here. And the, our technology is here. It's 3.8 uh, ratio. So this is uh, uh, a very convincing number that indeed the ship transportation of ammonia is far inferior in comparison to our uh, technology. 
And here is the value chain of the ammonia process all the way and the hydrogen storage based on formate as we see it here. And the difference is uh, clear. So in the future, we're going to see ships where the, the solution of the potassium formate will be carried globally uh, and easily. The ship doesn't have to be anything special. It can be ship that you use for, for oil or ship that you use for water and uh, whatever. And this is a, a case study where 100 tons of hydrogen is produced by solar electricity eight hours a day, transportation of 35, 600 tons of hydrogen every year by two methods, either HydroX or ammonia from Abu Dhabi to Tokyo or to Rotterdam. So this is the uh, figure we have here. You see the CAPEX for ammonia and for the hydro X, you see the monthly OPEX for ammonia and hydro X and for the 20 years lifetime, amazing difference. So this is one case study, second case study, uh, going from taking 100 tons of hydrogen produced by solar electricity eight hours a day, transportation of 108,000 tons of hydrogen every year, either by hydro X or by ammonia from Perth, Australia to Tokyo, and use of hydrogen at destination for eight hours per day. And this is the difference. Again, CAPEX, ammonia versus hydro X, monthly OPEX, ammonia versus hydro X, and finally, uh, 20 years lifetime, CAPEX and OPEX, and the difference is uh, clear here. Uh, I think we are at the end. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, so before I open up to uh, panel discussion, the questions, uh, let me share with a few uh, slides. Uh, share a few slides with you. Uh, this panel is about translation, scaling, system integration. And uh, when thinking about, you know, what do we need to do? Uh, I do want to share a few slides. Um, Actually, we should see them. Okay. So, um, using the examples of, uh, in my own institution at Stanford, um, and we have been doing energy research for uh, very aggressively, clean energy transition research for uh, uh, more than 20 years now, since our first uh, large investment by a uh, company on our project called Global Climate Energy Project, GSEPT, um, with, with the vision of uh, sustainable, affordable, secure energy for all. First of all, to, to, to really make an impact, we do need to have all the expertise need, uh, together that uh, not only science, engineering, technology, but also economics and policy. So this already means it's the whole uh, university, the whole campus effort. And we learn from each other uh, quite a lot. You know, something you know is uh, without regulation change, without policy coming in, it's not possible to go, go for scale. So we need to offer a platform using uh, Institute, Pico Institute for Energy to do that. So over the years, we have 300 uh, faculty involved in research, more than a thousand students, graduate student post at a given time as I'm speaking. This need, need to requ uh, this require integrating uh, from all the schools coming together. So um, appreciating the system level view to decarbonize uh, electricity grid is super important. Five, six years ago, so Bits and Watts initiative was launched using data and AI to help decarbonize the grid. St storing energy is in important as well as Storage X initiative. Natural gas initiative, uh, two, two big center, catalysis and materials. We are also planning carbon removal, just launched hydrogen last year. Uh, now planning sustainable manufacturing, cross-cutting also the finance, policy, education. And all of these are very important for today's purpose is this technology translation. 
how do we do that fast? Uh, we have been thinking about that quite a bit, particularly with the idea in mind, how do you go to scale fast? So last year at Stanford, we launched the new school called Stanford Door School of Sustainability. In addition to traditional uh, departmental structure, nine departments, there are also two institutes, uh, Energy Institute and the Environmental Institute already now in the school. Now in the process setting up the third one, the, the, uh, the third row right is the Green Color Institute for Sustainable Society. And last year also we launched the Sustainability, uh, sustainability Accelerator. Uh, I was asked to also uh, lead this uh, organization. Let me share with you, this is probably the most uh, relevant one for today. Um, instead of uh, traditional academia research, say you have a discovery, you think about where you are going to branch out from that, where would you go? For now, for, for the accelerator, instead of thinking about that, we have a destination on the right-hand side we call flagship destination. Uh, we identify the first flagship, that's to restore our atmosphere within 30 years. That means removing gigaton level per year of greenhouse gas from the atmosphere. With this uh, very ambitious goal in mind, we need to identify the gaps and the risks along the, you know, what's the a possible scaling pathway? You know, these gaps might lie into technology, might be policy, might be market, finance, and equity. It might also have unintended consequences we, we need to be aware of. Uh, uh, with the, uh, uh, the pattern that we need to develop scalable solutions and, and launch that. So that's, that's one thing is uh, this accelerator is doing. Uh, doing translation. So we are learning that uh, right now. Happy to get feedback from uh, 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 everybody here. The second one is uh, I <coughs> recognizing uh, translating technology across in so many areas, we need to mobilize our students and faculty. So the Tomcat Innovation Transfer Program at Stanford within pre-core has been around for more than a decade. Now we uh, spin out about 100 companies. Uh, uh, with uh, you know, $5.6 million invest in there, leading to uh, about $1.5 billion following investment. Uh, so this has been something we want to enhance uh, uh, tremendously, is to spin our company. With the recent uh, Stanford alumni gifts coming in, now setting up this new program called Stanford Ecopreneurship Program, is to develop students, entrepreneurs, uh, just launched this year, and uh, with uh, significant resources putting it in. Uh, now let me share with you from my personal experience, right, I want to condense back to some of the questions uh, just in a few slides. Um, so going from lab to market, and uh, what do we learn from that? So when I started my first company back in uh, 15 years ago, to commercialize silicon anode with high lithium ion storage capacity to nowadays, the amount of investment needed is gigantic. The, uh, uh, the scaling is very challenging, and uh, even just making the technology work is very hard. So learning from another uh, startup is uh, the air filtration technology using nanofibers is actually very similar, the pathway. Uh, and uh, in the last five years, also uh, setting up my own technology accelerator company called Inertech, spin now a grid scale energy storage company uh, uh, for integrating solar and wind into the electricity grid that's in the venue uh, with our own cooling and warming textile and so on. So with all this learning, <coughs> let me share with you, this is where I, I want to get to using my own language. <laughs> I'm going to ask our panelists just in a minute. <laughs> I see actually two valley of death, right there, two valleys. So the first valley, does the technology really work in the commercial sense? Uh, from uh, university lab or from national labs, right, so coming out, you have some outstanding performance matrix, but in order to have a working technology, you need to satisfy so many things in order to make it to work. Does it, the technology really work? This is the first valley of death. Maybe 
of the startup will die in the first valley, right? You see huge number of bodies in the valley, right, right, right here. The second valley of death, can the technology be manufacturable with the cost target uh, uh, realized? That's commercializable, means uh, there's somebody willing to buy, and that's second valley as well. Uh, for oftentimes, the second valley is also very hard to cross because the amount of investment need is so much bigger than the first valley. And now looking at energy solutions, some of the s relevant numbers we are looking into, like CO2, like 40 gigaton per year, electricity, electrical grid, the word electricity consumption is this 23,000 terawatt hour, and the amount of solar you need in the order of 10 terawatt. So given the production, yearly production, somewhere around 200 gigawatt production needs 50 years to produce. Grid scale storage, you know, to the extreme, right? We need 700 terawatt hour. We, we probably don't need that right away. Uh, this takes 700 years to produce. Transportation, 1.4 billion car and trucks on the street. The amount of battery we need is 100 terawatt hour. Again, this takes 100 years to produce, given current production capacity. I mean, this just gigantic number right there. And so what are the considerations to think about the scale, right? Not only technology need to work according to a commercial product level, but also the resource availability, manufacturability, global supply chain, market sequence, how do you get in? The, how do you do the financing, sub subsidy from the government or not, right? IRA is one type of subsidy from US government. So this all need to be considered uh, when I look at uh, technology from the lab going to the market with scale. So with this short presentation, let me uh, just pause right here. Uh, why don't we start a panel discussion? Maybe before everybody, uh, uh, chime in to ask the question. Let me ask the panelists one question that will open up. Um, framing the problem using the two value of death I just mentioned, would you be able to share with the audience based your, on your, the technology you're you are working on, the technology areas, analyzing that a little bit of uh, value of death, first value, second value, and any thoughts could you, uh, could you share? Uh, who wants to take this question first? Ted, you're looking at me. Maybe you'll do it. <laughs> yeah, I was going to jump in on your first valley. First, I thought it was a good construct. Yeah, I thought it was useful. And I feel like within the first valley, um, reliability and reliability under real use cases, like I was really struck when Marcus talked about the 2,000 different possible contaminants that people had discovered at PPB levels in his top gas. And um, I, I was thinking of other ways I was planning to test my system. I was thinking about sort of socks and knocks, but I wasn't thinking about 2,000 possible contaminants. <laughs> uh, and yet, you know, when you, when you engage with industry folks, you learn a lot about real problems that you might not know about within academia. And I think that one would, would fall in the first category. I mean, you, something could be manufacturable, something you could get the right price point with respect to Valley 2, but if it can't be reliable using the realistic input um, from the system, uh, it's not going to work. And it's another, it's also a good example of um, how basic, we, we can't stop doing the basic science once we start doing the engineering, but I'm pretty sure that to address Marcus's contaminants, we'll probably have to go back to some pretty deep basic science as well. Thank you, Ted. Um, yeah, George? George, yeah, George, yeah thank you. George. Um, uh, just uh, uh, given a remark on your first question, or the first uh, daily of rest, death, um, uh, I think um, uh, just uh, uh, referring to the 2,000 <laughs> components in the top gases, we just have to do something like a, 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 a continuous development just not think uh, technology is ready and then we can do the next step, but we have to do this continuously developing. And uh, we have to do for that uh, 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 different scale up steps 
uh, until the commercial stage and then uh, development will not end. We will have to continue development and we will close the cycle to the fundamental research at that point because we will have new foundings and new ideas which will improve the processes. And we will learn in the operation of the commercial processes how we can improve them further. This is the first uh, remark uh, on the first uh, value of death. And uh, in, in our approach, in our uh, um, uh, project, we are just doing that. We are just uh, um, uh, developing from the lab scale to the uh, commercial industrial scale. And then we will have not a drawback, but we will continuously um, uh, incremental uh, uh, optimizing this. Um, uh, and, uh, but uh, uh, what, what means uh, the technology, technology will work? means it that it will work today or in 50 years or what means that and so i think we should uh, have in mind that technologies have to be developed over decades and if we not start to uh, implement them they will never be ready so i think we should take the best pieces of technology and we take also the risk that it will not fit at the end of the day and uh, uh, this uh, is also um, uh, an aspect of the second uh, 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 value of death you mentioned. And this is uh, the larger one, I think. Um, uh, but uh, here uh, also the question is what means commercialability? Um, is it uh, the competition to the existing markets products, to the fossil products, which are very cheap because they have no environmental costs on it? Or is it uh, another scale? Uh, so here we are talking about regulation and boundary conditions, uh, what, what has to be adopted to the new situation. And that I cannot see worldwide. In Europe, you have some ideas to, to, to help here. But uh, if we have no regulations on that, um, uh, I think uh, new technologies are even very, very, have uh, an even very, very hard start. Thank you. I also see uh, Yo uh, on the screen. Do you want to make some comments? Yeah, yeah. I think this goes for the two valleys, actually, is that you should be ready for failure. Not only ready for failure, but you also uh, plan to learn from your failures. And actually, uh, you have to be patient. Uh, this is quite obvious. And things takes time. And you, by all means, learn from your failures and keep on going. Uh, then, in addition, the, the enemy of the, of, the, uh, of the good is the excellent. So good should be fine for you to proceed uh, with your development of the technology. And uh, uh, don't wait for the excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Now let's uh, uh, open up for everybody's uh, questions. I see Deepad has a uh, first one. I want to kind of uh, add a comment to uh, your two value of death uh, concept. I think in, in commercial business, that is fine. I mean, I think, you know, we've all gone through it and we've learned from failures because I think you only learn when you have failures. When you're working in something like the grid space, you have another very large value of death. Okay, and that is the adoption cycle that uh, utilities mm -hmm. have. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, they are not compelled to adopt new solutions. And, you know, as a startup, when you get your product to the point that your technology risk is behind you, and you've now got it to the point where commercially you're able to manufacture at scale so you can do the pilots that you want, your expectation, and A, you have ramped your team up so you're now able to execute. Your burn rate is very high at that point in time. And now you're waiting for the utility to say, yes, I will deploy. That can take 10 years. And that is what is killing a lot of the companies in this utility space. There's a, you know, the VCs say, why the hell are companies not succeeding? That is why we are not succeeding. Uh, and this is a real problem. And uh, th there needs to be a strategy to overcome that and, and to work with that. Thank you for sharing. In the uh, very heavily regulated area, that adoption time, this is probably a common problem. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Any other questions? Patricia. Thank you. Yeah, I would like to follow up on that comment because I also find that even in the research space of power dynamics in this case, for example, I feel that as a community we haven't converged to like a some interval of the parameters that we're looking at in terms of solutions. I feel that every group 
in different countries is looking at different approaches, which is great in terms of creativity, but I feel it's been really hard to have the community come to an agreement on where we should be focusing or what should be the principles that we should be looking at to move forward. And I do appreciate the consortia that there's been in the US, like Unify, or the one from the European Union, that I'm forgetting the name, that was super active a couple years ago. And like that, there are other consortia, I'm sure, but I feel internationally, we need to have perhaps more of this type of dialogue so we can start converging on what should be the things that we agree as a community, um, and then take that to, to market, of course, but I feel that in this particular space of power dynamics, we're a little bit uh, in the wild, wild west still. Yeah, perhaps I should add a little bit to just based on your comment. Uh, something I appreciate more and more recently, particularly across the boundary or between different countries, to make something scalable, we got to have a common standard. If you don't have a common standard, it's very, very hard to scale across the boundary. Uh, and uh, for a simple reason, yeah. Um, any other thoughts? I maybe have a, a small comment from an industrial point of view about uh, failure resistance. Um, unfortunately, many startups and uh, industries are not designed to survive failures. Uh, and this is maybe uh, something we, we should keep in mind. They, that, that means uh, we have to identify potential hurdles which we have to overcome as soon as possible and as early as possible. Uh, but uh, let's say uh, a second chance sometimes is not there or not on the market. So we maybe have to discuss how can we overcome that hurdles in cooperations. And uh, Mr. Mr. Derberg uh, make a point here, we, or you also make the point with the 2,000 substances. Um, we know about that, yeah, and that can be potential hurdle. And we have identified that, uh, just to, to stick on that example, very early in the stage. And yeah, that's a chance really to overcome that hurdle. And if we can design something like that, I guess we have a better chance to implement uh, technologies in the market and be successful. Thank you. Carla. Yeah, just to um, continue on the on the industry view. So, um, I mean, I'm I'm fully subscribing your uh, thoughts on the two valleys of death because I could add just um, uh, f uh, without uh, any um, additional so two uh, cases use cases that uh, that uh, haven't worked out commercially because uh, we didn't realize uh, the challenges um, in the. Uh, projects and in the process of scaling up. Um, so for me, it's important to share these cases. Um, not so easy, especially when, when, it's, uh, uh, when it's a failure that also is connected with money. Yeah? Um, and uh, we spend uh, quite a double digit uh, euro, a million euro amount on energy efficiency technologies uh, back in the 2010 uh, years. Uh, and we actually never really talked about it. Yeah? Um, and so um, for me, the question is because these technologies always pop up again, um, to ask also the question when something's popping up again, what's the difference? Why it should work now? So that I would add, uh, because some of the, of the topics are, I mean, from the, from the basic research around for, for ages, but, uh, but the question is why the commercial pickup has never taken place. So, so that I would, I would add, and mm -hmm. ha happy to, to share the use cases in a, in a um, separate discussion. S sounds good. Um, yeah. Please. Yeah. 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 I, I would like to, to pick this up with the failure because, in, for example, in oil and gas and geothermal industry, we are very familiar with failures. So only every eighth well in the oil and gas industry is a success. Uh, and I, I would also like to pick up what the Israeli colleagues said, and, and you have seen the dimension also in Israel, what the underground means. So I, I think we have to learn from our failures, and we have to include this maybe somehow also in the business uh, case. This, ha this has been done in the oil and gas industry. So maybe we should uh, go for this. 
Thank you. Let me add a little bit. So um, maybe f share my further thought on the second valley. Um, I mentioned this. I said the first one proving the technology is working. Let's pick a number. Let's say maybe from starting to fully proven, you spend 30 to $50 million to prove that. These financing tools to, to get to there. But the, when the second valley you want to go across, you need to build a certain scale of manufacturing. But at the moment, you are not fully proven. People will like to buy your stuff. There's still risk. So, but you are talking about a few hundred million dollars or euro putting in, and it becomes much harder to raise this type of uh, uh, money. The financing mechanism doesn't support that because you are not mature enough to get PE to buy in, to get the retirement fund to buy in, right? But uh, you need a lot of money, and uh, that is very easily die because financing mechanism usually don't you know, support that. Some people are very successful in raising that few hundred million dollars, improving that, and then get successful. I, I would argue, I know this is a science discussion, not uh, financing. However, if there's a financing mechanism, creative one, that could be used to finance the second value of death, that will pull a lot of new technology into the pipeline fast. That actually help R&D. So I want to <laughs> share my thought with you about this. You know, for, for a while, this financing mechanism U.S. looks good, but it was abused. It's actually the SPAC IPO. Uh, it was uh, abused uh, in, uh, in a way that uh, maybe too much has become a negative uh, uh, financing mechanism. Yeah. Sorry, I, I wanted to add a little bit more to the fact that we are talking science and we are talking about, you know, what we would call deep tech, where there is not a pull from the market for many of the things that are being developed out here right now. There is no proven market. And, and uh, to Yo's point, I think, you know, you're going to fail a lot at that point. It, you know, you're going to have to circle back. And to do that in a company environment becomes very, very challenging, right? What we are seeing is that the location where the deep technology, deep domain expertise is in the science lab, in the research center, right, that is where this nurturing of this technology needs to take place because there you can fail. It's no problem. You write a paper, it's great, and you can go on to the next thing. And you, but you, you need a funding mechanism for that, okay? There is no easy funding mechanism for that. But if you can get that, if you can get the in, input from industry that says here are things to watch out for, here are things that this is going to take across, I think you can substantially accelerate time to market, okay? I mean, when you have very big programs together, just getting the legal agreement sorted out can take five years, you know? So the amount of time it takes to get to real results is very complicated, very long. Small, you know, small groups that are all focused can do that with input from, so I, I would very much suggest that we should be looking at a model like that to, to accelerate this. Uh uh, I completely agree with you. I actually think this will be great. Carla, you should listen to this, right? BASF could be, can do something like this. Big enterprise can do something like that. Because not only is the initial invention is happen in university, you, you do that because all the expertise is right there. This infrastructure of research, you know, to, to solve this problem. Not only that, the cost to do the same thing. Inside university is so much cheaper than outside. This all adding together. And come back to Yo's point, then you can be patient. And when you say patient, doesn't mean you're slow, you're actually fast. I completely agree with this mechanism. It's a missing piece, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, so it, I actually wanted to make that comment a while ago, but this fit really well with Deepak's um, remarks around um, scale-up and innovation at universities. The key thing that to my mind in this discussion that we're, we're talking about is who, who profits, how is this becoming a business case, and how can it work? And so my question would be, 
to what extent do we already have the incentives for the industry to really decarbonize? And the carbon price is really crucial for that. And I'm not sure we are there. So that, that is creating an environment that allows also to invest in, in new technologies. Um, beyond looking only at the carbon price, I think the inclusion of ecosystem services in the pricing and the benefits to society is also crucial. And this is really, really, really difficult to, to assess. I mean, right now there is a conference with several dozens of researchers in, in Munich going on talking about how can, we pri how can we assess different methods of carbon dioxide removal? How can we evaluate what is actually working? And this is, this is really, really difficult. It requires also discussion with society. And so rather than asking what under the current conditions are business cases, we might also ask, are we already in the right environment? Do we already have the right boundary conditions for these market cases? And this was a comment that I that wanted to make because at the moment we don't see this yet um, in, in the environment because honestly, we really do need to go decarbonized. And this means that a lot of the business models we're seeing, sorry, and this is a comment now, a lot of the business models that I see scaling up are really focusing on um, fuels, methane, for example, but a renewable or an artificial carbon cycle is not sufficient to, to get us to this net zero and a net negative uh, scenario. So from a point of view of, of um, climate and environmental science, it's very clear that we also need to price in the other ecosystem services and include also um, benefits to society in the discussion and how to how to price this. This is really a political um, point of view, and we need to communicate that. Yeah, in, indeed, a, a scaling and equity issue. I mean, it needs to be strongly coupled. Without the equity consideration, scaling will be very, very hard as well. Yeah, appreciate that. Uh, Yo, you have uh, you raise your hand again? Yeah, yeah. If I may. Yeah, go ahead. The, um, we forget the issue of uh, education. And as uh, time is passing, the training of our PhD students is becoming narrower and narrower. In order to be in the front in science, you need to go deep. When you go deep, you lose your overview. And this means that PhD students and MSc students of today are not aware about the, all these issues of a business model and what is a good idea and how can I promote my idea into a, into a commercial uh, venture and so on and so forth. And I think this is part of uh, our responsibility to uh, um, change perhaps and to improve the uh, tools that our students receive through their uh, uh, learning period in the university. Yo, your presentation just now was a really good combination of science and business presentation. So we need to have that more. Right. Go ahead. There's something I really want to bring out because it hasn't come out and it's, I think, very, very important. Um, we forget about equity. Okay, uh, and we forget about the fact that, you know, if we put in place solutions again that only the rich countries can afford, we will make the problem worse as new technology comes in. We struggle with the question of how we adopt new technology into our existing, our, you know, infrastructure base, which makes it very complicated. But if we look at uh, the least developed countries, they really do not have an infrastructure. So I have always kind of pushed for the idea that they can be a really great proving ground to leapfrog, you know, from where they have, which is almost nothing, to what the new mm -hmm. system should look like, okay? And I think that would make it easy to pull it in here as well from there. So if, as we are looking for ways to kind of put these things in place, that's a place where you can get good subsidi subsidization and demonstrate it at almost country scale. And, uh, and then, you know, you have enough volume to mature these things, and then you can pull them in here as needed. So I think that, you know, needs to figure more actively in our discussion, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Go back to George. Uh, 
Uh, I would like to add uh, some uh, aspects on that. Um, uh, firstly, I think uh, we scientists should uh, be more open to cooperate in the companies, not only with the companies. We should go to the places where production takes place because then we can see what happens there and then what we can see what is needed there. If we are sitting in our university lab, uh, something happens and after three years we recognize nobody is interested in that. Oh. Damned. <laughs> so this is better just to cooperate uh, directly um, face by face, face to face. This one uh, aspect. Another aspect I think is also that we should um, scale up and, uh, uh, and uh, realize uh, and, and do a realization of technology uh, which are ready for the transformation, not for the end point of the transformation. And this is a hurdle we, we, we uh, daily uh, can hear, that people are talking about technologies which are ready in 50 years or so. But because then they are 100% carbon dioxide free, but we should also do and, and realize and, and establish technologies we have today Perhaps they can only um, uh, um, uh, decrease the uh, carbon dioxide emissions by, let's say, 50% or so. But if we do not that, then we have no transition pathway. And if we are doing that, then we can also use uh, the, uh, um, uh, the existing um, uh, assets, uh, like uh, infrastructure and uh, plants in the chemical industry, for example. Okay. Maybe one last question or comment. Uh, maybe also just a, just a comment. What I think is is very important if we go more to the public and then that we need more awareness for the new technologies and that people see that it's a bit like a adventure and that they want to take part. So if I look now on PV, I know when PV started in Germany, there are those people who put and in all the other countries mm. also you know it from US who put the first PV modules and they were proud to have some new technology. And I think we need to have this pioneering spirit also with, to share it with a broader audience. And another example is I was for a project on green cooking gas in South Africa uh, this, uh, this year, and it was also inspiring that we search for solutions which are better solutions, like for, 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 for all, because we, we, th this needs to be clearly done. Uh, sometimes you see the big graphs about yeah, also from Germany, we see, okay, there we do the PV and the windmills, and then the, we do the ammonia and then transport it to, to uh, Europe or to US or something. I think we, this is what, what I say. We, we really need to generate more fun and pioneering uh, among us, but also I think here we have it, <laughs> but, but I, we need to include the world. Yeah, the equity is uh, also be part of the pride. Um, so I think we start. Let's uh, thank all the three panelists thank, and thank you everybody for your discussion. Thank you.